Uh, this is joint work with uh, uh, Gila and John who are here and Sita who was uh, unable to, to make it this time. Uh, and what we were uh, working on and thinking about was uh, we, we motivated this or, or started this by thinking what if uh, kind of going forward wages are stagnant and real returns on um, bonds, stocks, what have you, are, are fairly low. Uh, what would someone need to do uh, if they got 30 years out, 20 years out, 10 years from retirement and felt like they needed to make some sort of change in order to improve their retirement picture? And it's kind of easy to sort of figure out what you could do. You can save more, you could uh, invest better, maybe hope for better returns, or you could, you could work longer. Uh, but the question we wanted to think about was, which of these would have a bigger impact, and would there be kind of an obvious winner? And so that's what this uh, work is really going to focus on, kind of the relative strength of these different strategies. In terms of what uh, we're going to do, I'm going to talk about a stylized model for uh, coming up with retirement income and assessing those options within that stylized model. And then Gila is going to uh, present some empirical work on the impact of working longer for some uh, actual retirees. So in terms of the stylized model, uh, it's pretty straightforward uh, wealth accumulation. So this is how your savings accumulate. There's some ending wealth. You make contributions C to that wealth. It, it earns the returns. The returns accumulate over time. And uh, one thing to see here, though, this is your this is your savings. So the things that affect the savings is what do you get in terms of return, how much you contribute, and then how long you're both contributing and how long that growth, so basically your retirement age is sort of how long that, that occurs. This is on the savings side. Um, we're going to take the savings and to make it comparable to Social Security, we're thinking of this as a primary um, uh, earner in a uh, married household. And so we're going to take the wealth that you've come up with some savings. We're going to annuitize that. And so we're going to use um, real annuity prices. And then we're going to add it to Social Security. And we're going to normalize by the ending wage and come up with a replacement ratio. And you need to make a number of assumptions in order to do this in the stylized model. Um, we're going to have a base case. And then we'll look at various permutations of different assumptions and see how that matters. But just to run through the base case set of assumptions, we have uh, constant real wages. So in um, real terms, wages aren't growing. In terms of contributions, we're going to start off assuming, uh, essentially, I think of it as somebody working at an employer that has uh, the most common um, uh, uh, 401k plan matching scheme, which is uh, 50 cents on the dollar up to the first 6%. Uh, and so if they're getting the full match, they're contributing 9% of salary a year. Um, we're going to start off with uh, constant real returns, where that constant return is zero. So 0% 0 real return going forward. And then our base person is going to be doing this for 30 years. So the, think of it, maybe they're 36, and they're going to retire at 66. Um, in terms of Social Security assumption, uh, this is, uh, comes from some analysis that the Social Security Administration uh, published a few years back. But essentially, if, uh, if you had the kind of economy-wide average wage throughout a working career, then the ratio of the PIA to the AIME, which is kind of like a replacement ratio, uh, is about 42%. It'll vary based on your wage path and income. Could be 25, could be 70. But we're, for a, a typical kind of middle income, 42%. So that'll be our base case. And again, we'll look at different permutations. Um, and then we went and got some annuity prices. And just so you can see, uh, annuity conversion factor for a real, with a joint and survivor, 100% payout. So again, this is like a primary earner Social Security annuity equivalent. It's about 3.7% uh, at 66 and about 3.8, 3.9 at 
for 67. One thing I do want to point out with these numbers is the actuarial adjustment for deferring buying the annuity from 66 to 67 is about 3.5% increase in income. Uh, Social Security for that age range is an 8% increase in income. So if you just want to kind of have a rough rule of thumb, the Social Security increase is about half actuarial adjustment and about half kind of benefit um, uh, generosity. <laughs> Uh, so when you see the Social Security impact, roughly half is actuary, roughly half is generosity. Okay, so that's, there's one other uh, key assumption that I wanted to underscore here, and this is as it relates to Social Security and claiming behavior. Um, we've done some papers, this, this uh, same group, on the benefits of deferring claiming Social Security and how optimally claiming Social Security can make a big difference in terms of your uh, retirement. Uh, but the kind of the fact remains, and this is something that John has done with uh, CETA before, most people bundle retirement and claiming Social Security. And so we're going to kind of assume people don't change their behavior. They maintain that through time. And so for us, oops. Um, we're going to have in this model working longer means claiming Social Security later. And this was a little uh, graph from an earlier work by, again, John and Cedar, that the big bar in the middle is basically 60% of the primary earner population are claiming Social Security right when they retire. No one, basically, is retiring who's eligible for Social Security and deferring claiming Social Security. Some do claim before they retire. So, in terms of behavior, um, we think this is a, a, a very reasonable assumption. In terms of possibilities, it's certainly possible to defer. But we're going to assume that those actions come bundled together. So that's kind of the base case of assumptions. When you run all that through and take a look at what does that mean for someone uh, and retirement income, uh, wanted to point out so this is from your savings. Uh, you annuitize your wealth. This is from Social Security. You're saving 30 years, 9% of income. Anyway, that turns into 10% replacement ratio. Social Security is 42%. So for this sort of middle income person, Social Security is by far and away the dominant factor in their retirement income. As in terms of proportions, it's 80%, and income from savings is 20%. It really could stop here. I mean, there's a lot more to go, but if you get, this is what kind of drives everything. Savings is kind of the small piece. Social Security is the big piece. So when we think about things that are going to impact retirement income, things that affect the small piece are going to have a very minor impact. Things that affect the big piece are going to have a relatively big impact. So when you think about saving more, that's affecting the small piece. Uh, investing better, that's affecting the small piece. Working longer, it affects both. You have more in terms of savings, but you also get higher uh, payouts from Social Security. So it's going to have a relatively big effect. And we're going to quantify that and see that, but that's kind of the underlying driver. Okay. So if you work an extra year, what happens, things get better, why, annuities are cheaper, you can earn a return on your uh, savings, you can make more contributions, and Social Security is increased. If you look at our base case and say, what happens if you work a year longer, retirement income goes up by seven and three quarters percent. If you were to decompose that as where does that growth come from? Eight percent from annuity prices getting cheaper. 8% uh, from contributions. We assume 0% real return, so there was no return there. And then 83% come from Social Security going up. And again, you can think about half that as actuarial and half benefit generosity. Um, why does Social Security dominate? It's, it's most of your income. Okay. You might think that's driven by the real return on assets being zero. So we, we looked at a little few different cases. Um, this is what I just presented, where 0% return, 
seven and three quarters percent retirement income here, and you see 80 plus percent contribution to um, income growth coming from Social Security. If it was 3%, uh, 71 percent is coming. So 3 percent investment returns. The investment returns do, the, the savings part do contribute a bigger fraction. Income growth goes go up, but still more than 70 percent is coming from Social Security. And then you can do 5 percent and it's, it's still. Uh, so if you think you're going to get 5 percent real throughout the whole 30 year horizon, uh, even in those circumstances, uh, Social Security is contributing a, the lion's share of what's happening when you uh, work longer. And again, it's just Social Security is a huge factor for uh, uh, mid middle income um, primary earners. It's an even huger factor actually for low income primary earners, but we'll see that in a second. Okay, what if you're not working one year longer? What if you're working two, three, four, five? Uh, here is the case that we were looking at, 66, one year, seven and three quarters. What I wanted to point out here was if you go out three or four years, you're looking at 20 to 30 percent more. It's almost impossible to get 20 or 30 percent more any other way besides working longer. And so that's kind of a, one of the takeaways when we looked at this was, was we could come up with other possibilities. This, this is kind of the only game in town for, um, again, this, this uh, prototypical base case. Now, at the beginning I said what we wanted to do was to compare the relative strengths of retiring later and other possibilities. So we're starting to do that here when we look at saving 1% more. So remember in the base case, we were saving for 30 years, 9%. This is looking at, well, so suppose you bump that up to 10%, so 9% to 10%. What happens? Um, well, your retirement income does go up 2% total. And then this just kind of normalizes by how many months would you have to work to be equivalent to 30 years of saving 1% more. And you'd have to work 3.3 months. You can actually, relatively right to just multiply that by 10 if you wanted to, just save 10% more for 30 years is roughly equal to working 33 months longer, three, three and a half. Two, two and a half, a little under three years. Um, if you think you're going to do better in terms of the returns on your savings, it does get a little bit, um, it, it becomes equivalent to working longer. So 5% real for those 30 years is five months of work equivalent. But that gives you kind of a relative magnitude of the power of work versus savings. Uh, let's see. Ah, so this, uh, the numbers you just saw were 30 years, so it was these two rows, starting at age 36, 0 and 5 percent return, so 3 and 5 percent, 3 and 5 months. Uh, if you started later, 20 years to go, 46, or 10 years to go, these are the numbers. I wanted to highlight these, so if you're starting saving when you're, or thinking about making an adjustment, not starting saving, thinking about making an adjustment, when you're 10 years out, 1% um, additional savings is roughly equal to working a month, a, a little bit more than a month longer. So if you were going to do 10% additional savings for those 10 years, it's, it's about like working a year longer. And it doesn't really, it don't have a lot of time for the return to matter, so it doesn't really matter that much. It's, it's kind of a year. Um, this takes a look at what if you didn't think the 42%, you want to look at different options or um, possibilities for that. Here we have um, broken it out by different wage groups. So suppose this was your um, annualized average monthly income from Social Security perspective. If that was it, you would have a 70% wage rate replacement from Social Security on down to if you had the max uh, Social Security wage, this would be the uh, formulaic replacement ratio. So uh, low income to high income, 
high replacement to low replacement. But basically the story is if Social Security is a bigger factor, then saving is going to be fairly less impactful relative to working longer because Social Security is going to be um, a, a bigger and bigger part of your retirement situation. So uh, again, maybe look at the 20-year category. If you're a low wage and you save, say, 10% more, it's equivalent to working 14 months, 10% more for 20 years, it's equivalent to working 14 months longer. And if you're high wage, it's equivalent to working 29 months longer. So you can kind of see the range of impact from different uh, magnitudes of Social Security. And finally, just to kind of put it in context of a better portfolio, we took a look at what if you were able to, um, you went from active management, say, to passive management, or uh, realized that you were overpaying, and you're able to reduce the portfolio costs on your portfolio by 60 basis points. What would that mean in the, in the uh, kind of context of what we're talking about, or the, the numeraire here of working longer? Uh, it kind of depends on what your returns are. Uh, if they're zero, saving 60 basis points over a 30-year career of savings is equivalent to being able to retire 2.8 months earlier. Uh, if you're getting 5% real, it's equivalent to 5.3 months earlier. So just to give you a feeling for how big a deal is it to um, get a, a more cost-effective uh, portfolio. So I guess the big takeaways. Uh, if you're 30 years out, saving 1% more is much less impactful than working one more year. It's about like working three or four more months. 10 years out, saving 1% more is equal to about working one month longer. And a middle class primary earner, 10 years before retirement, who's looking to have a big impact, where here it's like 20% or more impact on retirement income, they could work longer or, and not really much else you can do. So the kind of the big takeaway, most Americans working longer is the only way to meaningfully increase retirement income. And with that, let me hand it over to Gila to talk about the empirical work. Okay, um, okay so taking it uh, uh, to the empirical work. Uh, so as we just saw, there's a, we have a stylized model and we have uh, significant uh, returns. But as the uh, presentation we just saw, uh, the real world is that every couple has a very complex trajectory and we want to sort of see how it is in the real world for each couple. So we, we also use the HRS data. Uh, we, use, um, we take from the HRS data the age and the, uh, the, uh, are they married or not and the age of the spouse. That gives us the, we can figure out what an annuity price is using uh, external data about annuity prices for different ages. Uh, we also use the current wage and um, the balance, the DC balance for each couple. And then we use also the restricted HRS data to give us the earnings history. And that allows us to figure out the AIME and the PIA for each uh, individual. With that data, we restrict our sample to uh, those that are primary earners. So in a case of couples, that means the one that has a higher AIME and for, in all singles. Uh, we further limit the data to those that are of age 61 or 62 in the wages of 2010 through 2014. We do that to be able to, first of all, use uh, all individuals that sort of face similar uh, social security structure and uh, similar financial um, uh, situation, uh, in, like after recession. Uh, and then we also want to use people that are still at the age where they're making that decision, so age 61 or 62. If we only look at those that are age 66 as the mainly the focus of the stylized model, we'll lose a lot of the individuals because many people already retired by the age of 66. Uh, so with the restricted uh, sample, we're about 1,000 individuals in our data. The assumptions that we use are very similar to the stylized model. The uh, one I would like to highlight is the first one. 
has to do with that we assume that the working one more year will not have an impact on your AI impact. This is a conservative assumption. Uh, for most individuals, if they work one year longer, it's probably going to increase the, their AIME and further have higher returns on their uh, for working one more year. So we are going to uh, assume that that's not the case. Uh, beyond that, the assumptions are very similar as the stylized model. So we assume that the Social Security benefits are claimed at retirement. And uh, that the, another important factor is that the secondary, um, uh, uh, the spouse, is retiring at age 62. So sort of forcing specific trajectory uh, on the couple. We do that because we really want to focus on the returns of working longer for their prime. Um, and again, the other assumptions are similar to the satellite model. So uh, the main result that we find is that the, uh, the majority of returns are at about 6.3, 6.7%. Uh, however, there is a, um, quite a dispersed um, uh, returns, and they go from about 3% at the low range and approximately 10% at the high range. And this is, of course, because there's couples that have, some have accumulated a, a lot of wealth, and so the impact of, of, uh, of their, of, of working longer might be a bit smaller than lower income uh, individuals where uh, working one, one more year will have a big impact on social security, and so will have a larger uh, impact. Then we sort of break down the different types of people that we see in that first graph. So here we break it down by income quartiles, and the income quartiles are based on the household income. And we sort of see that those that are at the lower uh, income quartile, are, which is the blue line, are uh, kind of concentrated at that 6 to 7%. And those at higher income quartiles are much more dispersed. Uh, be, again, because the stories are a bit different, uh, some have high wage at the very last year, uh, and some have very high uh, uh, wealth, and so that will have an impact on the returns. Here we see uh, what would happen if they work uh, one year, three years, and five years long. And as we expect, uh, the further you're willing to be working more, the returns are going to be higher, and they can even be over 100%. So you can increase your retirement income by over, uh, by doubling it by working uh, uh, eight years long. And as we increase the duration, also the uh, how much dispersed the data is is also increasing. So just to conclude, uh, both parts that you've just saw now. So for sure, working longer can substantially increase retirement income, and for most people, it's the it's the it's just the, such a huge impact that nothing else can can uh, can compare. We're not saying here that there are some people that the cost of working one year longer is very, very high in terms of, like, they, they, their, uh, their preferences are that they really not want to do that. So we're not saying that's not right. That's, for all those people, that's fine. We're just laying down very clearly the, the value of working longer as well as the comparative other alternatives to working longer. And uh, the data suggests uh, that the... Working longer can increase returns by 3 to 10 percent, where the majority is approximately at 6.2 percent. Um, that's all. Thank you. I'll take it. To... Starting my watch. So I really liked the philosophy and the usefulness of this paper. It begins with an important question. Why don't more people retire, uh, plan better, or plan at all, for retirement? Could be myopia, they don't want to think about it. Retirement's too far away in the future to worry about. Too many things could change between now and then, why bother? Or it could be the lack of relevant information, even if someone did want to plan ahead. To plan accurately, you need to know all sorts of information that you don't know and can't know. The economy's future, your future, your health, your spouse's health, your kid's health, your employment future, your asset choices and their returns. Or third, it could just be unpleasant. I don't want to think about being old and retired. 
This really upbeat paper will make people feel much better about their future. In contrast to most of the really depressing material that I teach in a course on the economics of aging. What's depressing? Huge demographic shifts towards older societies around the world, more people like me. Um, the future of Social Security, I don't know what's going to happen, but some hurt is coming to somebody before the trust funds run out. Contributors, retirees, we'll see. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid, who knows what's happening? That might not be pretty. In contrast, this paper says, folks, there's hope. For many of you, your economic future is in your hands. If you don't like what's coming, here's what you can do about it. Here's the levers you can pull. Here is how much impact the various things that you can do, do now or do later, will have on your financial well-being in retirement. And most interestingly, there are trade-offs, and here they are among the various things that you could choose to do. It's really a manual for retirement planning, which people desperately need because many are so reluctant or unable to plan for their retirement. As you now know, the bottom line of this research is two words, work longer. The authors introduce a very useful new unit of measurement, which I loved, and that is an additional month of employment at the end of your work life. And everything else is described in terms of that unit. How many months of additional work at age 66 is that other alternative that you're thinking about equivalent to? And the answer is always not many. For all the retirement decisions you can make, the authors asks, ask, how much wealth will this add to you at your chosen date of retirement? And if we turn all this wealth into a joint and survivor annuity and add Social Security, which is an annuity, how much annual income can you and your spouse expect until death? They then ask exactly the right questions about savings and retirement decisions. What does this do to my wealth at retirement? And what's the marginal impact of this decision on the annuity this wealth can buy when I retire? They look not only at what decisions you might make, but when you make them. And for savings, of course, this makes a difference. Late is often too late to make a difference. They turn a big, daunting, amorphous question, how can I prepare for retirement, into smaller, more manageable decisions. How much should I save and when? When should I retire? When should I claim my Social Security benefits? Which the authors assume happens at the same time as retirement, something I will re return to in one of my few complaints about this paper. As you saw, they first do this for stylized households in which all the major points are made basically with means and averages. And then they apply the methodology to actual workers in the HRS, which gives these, distribu which gives these means distributions and sometimes very wide ones. But the point is always the same. Nothing beats, or even comes close to, working a little more at the end of life. Working more is the only decision you can make that affects all of the components that go into, a, into, a, into your annuity. You will have more earnings, which will increase your assets if you save some of them. If you have a retirement plan, defined benefit or defined contribution, your pension will be higher if you work some more. And if you delay receiving Social Security benefits until retirement, which the authors assume you do, you will have higher Social Security benefits. And that turns out to be the most important of all. And these Social Security benefits are then added to the annuity that you get from piling all the other sources of wealth together. And that's what you live on. And finally, if you do delay, you will then have fewer retirement years ahead of you over which to consume what you've accumulated. In their methodology, it means you can buy a larger monthly annuity with the same amount of money the later you do it. Additional savings increases only one component of final wealth. In contrast, working longer hits on all cylinders, savings, pensions, and Social Security. That's why it rocks. The results, which you have now seen, are really remarkable. At age 62, 
working one more year increases all your future retirement income by about 7%. Not bad. Three more years increases it by a quarter. Four more years by a third. Six more years by 50%. And eight years, we're delaying from 62 all the way up to 70. And of course, you should claim your Social Security benefits at 70 because they don't go up anymore. Delaying for eight years all the way up to 70 increases your annual income by 75% for the whole rest of your life. The growth rate, the income growth rate by doing these very things for delayed retirement varies slightly, but hardly enough to worry about by earnings level, as we just saw. It also varies pretty inconsequentially by for couples versus single men versus single women. There are differences, but they're not that important. What I found surprising in this paper is how inconsequential all the other changes other than working longer have in improving your retirement income. As we saw, saving 1% more starting at age 36 at a 5% interest rate, which certainly sounds like a good thing to do, is equivalent to working five months longer. Hardly a baseball season. And of course, even less than that if you increased your retirement at something later than age 36. Finding more efficient portfolio manager, cutting your basis points in half for 30 years seems like a good idea. It's the equivalent to three, or six, three to six months of additional work. And even various real returns, real investment returns, which in this paper are soon to be zero, sadly accurate at present, but even changing that makes relatively little difference compared to a little more work. I thought the last part of the paper, which we just heard about, where you look at actual people, was really interesting. The means that we saw are turned into distributions, and sometimes pretty wide ones. For example, that 75% increase for your stylized individual, delaying retirement from 62 to 70, has a distribution with significant mass we just saw, all the way from 40% up to 100%. And that's obviously a big difference. 100% is doubling your uh, retirement income for life. So I had four questions and suggestions. The first, the first is about this point I just made. It makes a big difference whether you're the 40% person or the 100% person if considering delaying from 62 to 70. And what does that depend on? And we did hear a little bit about that. But does it depend on something that potential retirees would know. Would I know if me working from 62 to 70 is a doubling or increasing by 40%? Because that's really a substantial difference. And would an individual have sufficient knowledge to know which of them I am? Secondly, and this is really my only squawk, the one really important decision that you made in your research that I didn't like is insisting that the retirement decision and the decision to claim Social Security benefits happen at the same time. As you point out, they don't have to, but as you also point out, for most folks, about 60%, they do do both at the same time. But should they? Once you're past your normal retirement age, you can keep earning and claim Social Security benefits. You can keep earning and delay Social Security benefits so that they get bigger. You can stop earning and claim benefits you can stop earning and delay benefits. These are two separate decisions, and they're both important decisions. As a matter of fact, they're the two most important decisions you have to make late in life. I think a very valuable extension of your work would be to separate those. For those with a decent lifespan, regardless of your retirement decision, delaying Social Security benefit receipt, receipt until age 70 is a really good idea if you can afford to do it. It's fabulous longevity insurance. A point that you could make and emphasize if you separated the retirement and Social Security decisions. Now, for just this reason, I waited until age 70 to claim Social Security just recently. Banking on longevity. Yeah. <laughs> You've anticipated my next remark. <laughs> If the Grim Reaper shows up soon, my dying words are going to be, assuming my two kids bother to show up, 
my dying words are going to be, love your kids, uh, produce some grandchildren for your poor mother, and damn, why didn't I collect Social Security at age 62? I'm going to go out on a real sour note, and it's mostly going to be that Social Security thing. But there's still hope. Um, a third point, which I'll mention only briefly, one, but it refers actually to the fabulous paper by uh, Carmen and Brown that we just heard. One subtlety you didn't mention is that there are obviously many options besides continuing to work on your current job and retiring. We all know there's a whole world of intermediate steps, gradual retirement, bridge jobs, all the things we just heard about. They often involve fewer hours and lower pay, but they might be an option for somebody weary of a career job but who still would like to take advantage of the benefits of working longer, which this paper shows. Or they want, may want to move uh, to a place with better weather, or closer to the grandchildren, or further away from the grandchildren. I actually don't think I would add this to this paper, even though it's an important part of the retirement world. More than half of people who leave their full-time career jobs don't leave the labor market. They go do something else, these bridge jobs. Uh, I'm not sure, I think it might just cloud this paper, uh, even though a majority of people do this. And here's my fourth and final point. Um, I'm sure you'd love to see this paper in the AER, and of course, so would I. But I'd also like to see these results in USA Today, or the Atlantic Monthly, or the New York Times Magazine section, or available from AARP or TIA. Not in this academic form, obviously but in a sautéed down version that could be understood by educated laypersons, many of which have options about when to retire and don't know what this paper makes clear. Um, in, as a matter of fact, I sat next to a guy on the way out here, and he started talking about retirement. I think I talked him out of it. I brought this paper out. I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. I have his card. I'm going to send him a couple more papers. I think I changed his mind. From this paper, that's one for one. This is it true. I can tell you, I have his card and blah, blah, blah. So um, anyway, um, most people, I think, don't know how unbelievably important this decision is. And the fact that you can make up for prior bad decisions or non-existent decisions by working just a little bit longer. There's forgiveness out there, economic forgiveness. And for a recovering Catholic like me, this is reassuring. That would actually be, and I'm dead serious here, a great public service. Find some way to get this information out to the people. What's different about this decision is that it is your decision. It's the worker's decision, unlike so many other factors that are going to affect your, my, retirement well-being. What can an individual do? about what Social Security is going to do to balance the books before the trust, runs, for, trust funds run out. Th that might well involve retirement benefits, which is bad news for retirees. What can you do about it? Nothing. All right, write your senator. Uh, what can an individual do about the future of Medicare or Medicaid? Nothing. Write your congresswoman. What can you do about your employer's decision on post-retirement health insurance, if anyone even has that anymore? Nothing you can do about it. You can write to HR. What can you do about the future rates of returns on assets, interest rates, the stock market? All these other important things are entirely out of your hands. The one thing you can do, most employees, not all, is decide when to stop working. And as this paper so beautifully shows, there is no decision that's more important than this one you can make, not by a country mile. So I actually think this is a, not only is a good academic piece of work, but it's a really enabling piece of research that would make a lot of workers who are justifiably worried about the economics of their retirement and all the things they didn't do in the past, it would make them feel a lot more confident about their future. So I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I will filibuster while my co-authors figure out how to answer his questions. Uh, but let me just say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I have to plead guilty as a hand-picked discussant. Uh, <laughs> um, one thing that I did, though, uh, a, um, I presented the following question to a random uh, Nobel Prize winning economist. I said. Uh, if at age 36 you save, 
you're thinking about, should I save 10% or 9% uh, for the next 30 years for my retirement? And then you say, well, instead of saving 10, what if I stick at 9 and I decide I'll work a little longer to have, so I have the same sustainable standard of living for the rest of my life when I do retire? How much longer would you have to work uh, to not do that, to be equivalent to saving the 1% more? So his answer was, I think it'd be a couple years. Well, it turns out it's three months, three or four months. Uh, so I think there, I was a little surprised at how, this is for the median guy, but how, um, you know, how little it is. And as Jason said very clearly, the reason that it is little is that when you work longer, you increase and you delay your annuitization and you delay your Social Security, every component of your income goes up. Your Social Security goes up, your uh, annuitized 401k goes up for three different reasons. The annuity price goes down, and you know, you know what I mean? There's three different reasons, a little more compounding, a few more contributions. Uh, but when you save more, you're just increasing that 20% of your income. The other 80% is not increased at all. Uh, so even if you increase that 20% by 10%, it's not going to make as much difference as working longer. So I, I think we were surprised at the results, but I think at the end of the paper, we understood them. Uh, maybe we didn't at the beginning of the uh, paper. Um, I think your one point, uh, maybe my co-authors can help, but the one point of why are these distributions so large, the 40 to 100%, a good one, particularly the 100% ones. Uh, the, the ones that are probably close to 75%, 72%, that probably is the low income people where the social security effect is just dominating. And for the high income people, you get a big range, I think. But, uh, but why you get the 100 occasionally, you know, I, I don't know. Um, all your appointments, your ideas were good, including writing for the USA Today. <laughs> If my co-authors want to say something, or, or anybody else wants to say anything, oh, no, I, the um, I thought the uh, the deal was I would present and you would answer all the hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're, you're there weren't a lot of hard questions. Yeah. The hardest one was that wide distribution. Yeah, I, um, again above the seventy-five. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that, my guess is there's a, a spousal something going on, but I have to go look at that. Yeah. Yeah, we know that we know you. We know the Social Security yeah. is seventy-two, but it's a weighted average of the two. And yeah. so, how do you get the weighted average above seventy-two? Um, I think we have to think about it. Would it be easy to separate those two decisions and show people that yes, if you retire now and don't claim Social Security right now, but claim it later, look how much better off you'll be. We Seems like there's an educational that. component. Definitely do that, and as, in a way, we've already done it, not yep. in this paper. You know, if you merge our various papers, we've already done it, but we could do it again. Yeah, and I think to um, kind of roughly get at your question, uh, again, about, about half of the weight that's being carried by Social Security is going to, you could get without working longer by Correct. just delaying it, and yep. about half you'd have to. Uh, just, just for the uh, finance people, there, when we have a 5% assumption, say, it actually is a geometric 5%, which probably requires an arithmetic 6.5 or 7, uh, the way uh, financial returns work. Uh, so at least the finance people understand that. Yeah. So uh, th thanks, Jason. That, and Gila, that was a great presentation. And the, the work we've done agrees a lot with your work. And I just wanted to talk about the implications of one of your slides, Jason, where you showed that Social Security represented 81% of the total income. And what do you do with that other piece, the savings piece, and the implications for that? And um, the work we've done shows, because uh, that's the question, what do you do with your IRAs and your 401ks? And what we've done is an analysis that we compared 292 different strategies using delay Social Security, don't delay, buy an annuity, don't buy an annuity. And the implications of 81% of your 
or 80 or whatever it is be of your income provided by Social Security profoundly impact what you do with your savings. And what we're showing is that if you optimize your Social Security by taking a portion of your savings and delaying it till 70, that's by far a better solution. Uh, that's the best thing you can do with your money if you, delay, if you retire before 70. And then the remaining piece, it almost doesn't matter what you do. Um, so instead of annuitizing, most people don't want to buy an annuity. If you, what we were seeing is if you just take the IRS required minimum distribution, couple that with a low cost target date fund, that actually compares better than most other solutions. You know, buying an annuity or a GLWV annuity or an FIA. And so it profoundly simplifies the retirement planning process is A, try and delay both Social Security and drawing down savings till 70. But if you can't do that, then the first thing you should draw from is your savings and delay Social Security. And if you're going to draw from your savings, put in a short-term bond fund or a money market fund. And then the piece that you're going to use for your retirement income, if you just invest it in a low-cost index fund or balance fund or target date fund and take the RMD with it, that actually compares better than most other strategies that we looked at. And so it profoundly simplifies what is, for a lot of people, a very complex decision. And it also lets some people realize that if I just work enough to be able to delay Social Security and my savings till 70, I could just work part-time from 62 till 70, just cover my living expenses and delay both of those pieces. So it really helps put together what to do with your savings and then how much to work. And so we just finished a paper this morning. Timing is good. I finished a paper this morning titled How to Pensionize Any IRA or 401k. Um, and it explains all these concepts in, in simple ways to ex explain. So just wanted to add on that that one slide really has profound implications if you carry it all the way through. Other comments? Yeah. Um, hey, John. So, um, so I'm... Uh, bit of a naysayer here because uh, Alan and I did a study where we um, looked at people working an extra five years older people and we found that on average that would raise their sustainable living standard by five to eight percent so much smaller than you folks are you know suggesting so so I have a couple questions one is are you assuming that all the extra earnings are saved and not spend it all until the retirement happens. That's one question. Another question is, are you taking into account taxes? Are you really focused just on income as opposed to uh, discretionary spending? Or we're focused on discretionary spending, and, and part of your discretionary spending is being financed out of your assets that you've accumulated. So, so just increasing your you know, labor income, you're not going to Let's think, let's think about somebody who had a lot of, of assets that have a pretty high level of discretionary spending to begin with, and then working more wouldn't necessarily lead to much higher um, living standards, proportionally speaking. So, you know, we're, we're running the uh, survey consumer finances through this uh, uh, software that um, has all the taxes and all the transfer pro programs. Uh, and we're getting a different answer. OK, so we'll uh, kind of. uh, maybe Jason and I can uh, combine on the answer. But let me just start off with a simple one. Uh, if you work longer, we only assume that you save 9%. It's the same that you've been saving all along uh, out of those incremental years of work or months of work. We're not saving everything. We're just saving. We're just contributing a 9%. Uh, another thing that I know you do that we don't, you treat the earnings test as a as a tax, uh, we don't. Um, well, we have recomputation of earnings, so. Yeah, that should actually we have help. We have the adjustment of the reduction factor included, so we're, you know, when it doesn't really constitute a, a tax, the program knows that, because we do yeah. do the adjustment of the reduction factor. And, you know, one thing we don't do is tie retirement to uh, if you increase your years of work, we don't increase your Social Security uh, collection age. Right. Nor I think that's the change your annuitization. It's a big. Uh, so if you work five years longer, and Social Security is most of your income, Social Security goes up forty percent. 
Uh, so that's a, it's hard to get down to 5%, no matter what your taxes are, I think. But anyway, Jason, why don't you help me out? Oh, no, I think, I think that's pretty much it. The, um, if you have uh, work that doesn't result, if working longer doesn't result in claiming later, then, you know, if Social Security is sort of locked in at whatever it is, and then you work longer and look at that margin and don't tie them together, I could see getting 5%. But if, if it is tied to Social Security, I think... Uh, so I think the message is really you have to wait to take your Social Security later because that's a big, that's really where the big... Yeah, and what, what is it going to take to yeah. get people to do... Or, or annuitize later, too. It's, a, it's about half the, yeah. the size, like I said. Yeah. No, uh, it, it, the deferral is, is a key to this paper, and uh, if you don't assume the deferral. On both sides, because the annuity, yeah. too, the annuity deferral and the Social Security deferral. Yep. It's a huge, 90% 90 percent, 90 percent of the story. Of that, so it's, it's, it's how do you generate income? It may be from work, but it's how do you generate income so that you can defer? That's exactly right. Yep. Other questions? Well, yeah, I think it was tying back to this deferral, but I think a big you know, part that bridges that gap is about yeah, the low income whenever you do retire versus total retirement income. And that waiting five years to claim Social Security, that's definitely bumping up the flow once you get it, but you're missing that five years, which would feed into the feasible consumption over the life cycle, but not, so that, that's one sense in which the calculations are pretty different. I think that would help bridge the gap a lot. Yeah, so we are not uh, looking at the present value of what you get from Social Security or the present value of your annuity. We're simply looking at your monthly income. And if your life is short, well, it's short. But we're looking at the, what we, we call the sustainable monthly income. John, we're kind of right here at the bottom. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> I have uh, two, two kind of questions. One is, is uh, that I was wondering, I really like Joe's idea about sort of having a manual for retirement, and I was wondering if that could become a training manual for Social Security uh, employees that could give better advice than they do than they do now about this. And it seems to me that 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 would be uh, uh, the right point of entry to get people to think both about their claiming decision and about their retirement decision together, and do it in a way focusing on variables that they themselves control, as, as, as Joe said. Uh, the one qu a further question I had was how you treat mortality variation in, in this. There's a lot of, a lot of heterogeneity in, in mortality, uh, both in this, uh, Peter Hudemann and I looked at both subjective probabilities of, of longevity and also objective probabilities of longevity, and there's a lot of variation there and uh, one gets the impression that a lot of people worry that they're they're not going to get their money's worth out of out of Social Security because because they're going to die. How do you deal with that in in this paper? How do you well deal with look? If we were trying to calculate present values, you'd really have to know life expectancy or whatever or how long they're going to live. But we're just looking at their sustainable monthly income that essentially are offered by Social Security and insurance companies. Um, um, so it's, it's kind of a, a myopic uh, look at how well off you are. Uh, but in a, the way we do it, if you're getting so 7000 a month, uh, then that's your standard of living. And we don't really so, pay any attention to whether you're going to live 10 months or 100 months. Okay, so then, then one of the things that you're doing is emphasizing properly that uh, Social Security and annuitization in general is longevity insurance. Yes. And that, yes. And that should go in the manual, too. Yep. John, right behind you. So the news that um, working longer solves everything is terrific news for those of us who, like, fail to plan ahead properly, right? That there's a way out, right? But the flip side is also that for those people who are not able to work longer, yes. either because their health prevents them or because they or their employer their job prevents at them, sixty-one and they can't get hired to another job at sixty-two, like they're really scuppered. You know, they're in really bad shape because you know, to some degree, the choice to work longer is one's own choice, and to some degree, it isn't. So, as I'm wondering, as you start to think about how you turn this into the manual or the policy proposals. What would we need if we say to people, what you should do is work longer, 
but we can't but for those of you who can't work longer what kinds of things you know and these are people who probably wouldn't qualify for SSDI you know it's not going to solve for everyone right. but for those who can't work longer what would we need well I think it's a good qualifier I mean we should say you should work longer if you can rather than just say you should work longer because I, I certainly agree that some people uh, can't um, I think we'd have to think a little more about what what the strategies avail remaining are if you can't work longer you just don't but that's a good we should not and we don't intend to have this be the answer for everybody. Uh, what we did would say though that uh, what we found slightly surprising, at least when we began, is if you are healthy and you can work longer, um, the relative power of working longer to saving more was even bigger than I think we expected. Um, and um, like I said, we, we came to understand it but that was something we understood as we wrote the paper, not something we knew when we started. You might Can even I? be able to say, um, as a hedge to not being able to work longer, might be one of the stronger arguments for why you might want to save. The, uh, we also, I, 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 um, I we also had the idea that you know, early in your life, you've got lots of choices, like when to start saving, or you know, kind of how much to save. But by the time you get two thirds into your career, first of all, when to start saving? Well, that's Sorry, you can't redo that. That's done. Uh, saving more becomes kind of less powerful as you go through your life cycle. Working longer does not become less powerful. It's still a powerful thing to, to you could choose to do that at 62 or 63 or 64. Uh, saving more is kind of gone by that time. Uh, starting saving earlier is gone. Uh, getting a cost efficient portfolio is not going to be very powerful because there aren't many compounds left. Um, and so it, 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 its relative power gets much stronger as you move through life's course. I think that the one risk that I would see here is that if people believe that they can just solve their problems by working longer later on, that might actually discourage them from saving early on. And yeah. so to getting that balance between encouraging right. savings now and, and is, is really important because it could happen that when they get to the age of 63, they can't actually work for whatever reason. Yeah. But they've counted on the fact that they can just work longer. Right. Our base case person is actually a pretty good saver. Save for 30 years, 9%. Um, I think, uh, I'm, not, I'm sure you got more good comments, but I, I think we should preserve the break. <laughs> Back at three.